Uh, we're here to introduce you to Backstage's new backend system. Some of you maybe already heard about it. Um, but I hope you will still leave um, from here, like learning a few new things about the system. And if you've used Backstage before, and you've you probably spent a lot of time, you know, writing and maintaining backend plugins. Uh, the Backstage maintainers at Spotify have recently focused a lot of effort in improving the framework within which these plugins are written. written. Before we dive into that, Tika, I think the audience want to know a little bit more about you. So let me introduce you a little bit. Okay. So uh, <laughs> Tika is uh, not only a great engineer, but um, she's been working at Spotify for the last two years or so in my team. And she's super uh, focused on like product-driven um, engineering and shaping its life cycle around the needs of the customer market. Um, she loves traveling, and as you can see uh, on the picture here, spend time in the mountains, um, and brings a lot of positive energy to our team, which I'm very grateful for. So. I guess I do, but let's, <laughs> let's talk about you again, the stuff you do. So Emma is this brilliant software engineer on our team. And she loves users, whether they be developers or like, and you know, your product end users. If they have needs, she's going out, identifying them, fixing them, making sure they're getting the best experience. So she's perfect for, you know, just identifying all their needs and like getting it done. So I love that about her. And when she's not doing that, she's out there in her garden, like growing some veggies. And uh, yeah, and you know, Emma, you've got so much experience working on backstage, whether it's like our internal backstage or OSS, or, and now like we're working on Portal. I bet you have a lot of stories, like interesting stories of the stuff you've experienced. So do you have anything to share with the audience today? I guess I have. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to 2022. Um, so my team was on a mission at Spotify to unify the new um, open source search platform with the backstage search running internally at Spotify um, so that we could leverage all the new exciting stuff that it came with, uh, the flexibility and the customization. And part of this unification included collaborating with many teams um, to migrate their indexing processes over to the new search concept called Collators. And to not dive too deep into the search architecture today, because we don't really have time for that, I guess. Um, but a collator is, just quickly, a collator is what's responsible for you know, gathering data from a given source and um, transform it so that it's ready to be indexed um, into the search engine. Um, and part of this migration, we had to figure out how to solve ownership. Since we could now let these domain experts at Spotify extend the search platform, we also wanted them to have the flexibility to change things without us as the core team um, being the blockers. Um, so let's take a quick look at what that included. Um, so the first step that we collaborated with these domain experts to uh, do was to create the collator itself. Uh, we then wanted to register this collator into the index builder, and this happened in the backend setup of Search itself. Then when we registered the collator, um, they could either um, decide to use like one of the shared schedules that we have uh, defined already or define their own. Um, and when the collator then was registered, as I sent, said, we wanted these domain experts to have full control and over, uh, ownership over this. So the most obvious way for us to solve this was through code owners. So basically, all the teams had to go and create a GitHub team, uh, which they then updated a code owners file um, with entry. So that, uh, that was like part of the shared repository. And at this time, when we migrated over to the new search platform, uh, the new backend system didn't really exist. Uh, but today, we wanted to walk you through how we could have done this a little bit differently uh, with the new backend system to solve some of these problems that we're seeing. So Tika, I guess maybe you can kick us off um, introducing us to the building blocks of the new backend system. I can try. OK, so on the screen now, you've got a snapshot of the new backend architecture. And in our new system, we still have a friendly neighborhood backend plugin, which, which we all love, right? Because that, that builds the entire backstage platform for us. And uh, this can be ex extended within certain boundaries, which are defined by extension points. Now, these extension points are actually exported from the backend plugin library, but implemented within the backend plugin itself and registered within the plugin as well when they initialize. Now, backend plugin modules will call these extension points with arguments that extend the functionality of the backend plugin. 
In the context of search backend, we can use these principles that we're seeing on the screen here, like of this architecture, and define collators within their own backend modules, and then add them to the search backend plugin. Uh, I know it's a lot, lots of stuff going on in this picture, and we'll try to break it down, but try and take a mental picture of this slide, and we'll, we'll kind of proceed to take a look at some of the code that will bring uh, this migration into uh, fruition. Um, so starting with like, okay, uh, first thing we're thinking about is, uh, do we have any search packages available in open source that we can reuse, right? Um, let's have a look. So it turns out there's this uh, search index registry extension point that's available to us in the search backend node package. Um, and uh, this one is again like exported in the search backend node library. Uh, the interface, as you can see, contains uh, the add collator method, and that takes an argument of type register collator par parameters, but don't, don't need to know exactly what that type contains. It's essentially tidbits that are required to build out your search collator. Um, now, this extension point is implemented in the search plugin um, and within like the search index registry class. And here, if, if you take a look at like some of those pointers, like on the slide, um, there's that list. You've got like an internal list of these collators that are going to be held within the plugin. And in the implementation of add collator, you'll see that any collator that's passed or like, a, yeah, that's passed to this function when it's called is essentially going to be pushed to that list. So then while creating the backend plugin, we create an instance of this registry class that we just, you know, the implementation of it, and then we register it within the backend environment. Uh, when the plugin is initialized, we grab all the collators and pass it to the search index service. Uh, I think these should be highlighted in the purple boxes here. Uh, apologies if you can't see it in the back, but you should have come and sat in front. Anyway, <laughs> in, in short, uh, the search index will be built using all of the collators that are now available in the search backend plugin. Um, wait, wait, I did say collators available in the search plugin, nice, but what are these collators that I'm talking about? Um, but before we get into that, we're going to first start with writing this internal search backend with a new backend system. Okay, so Emma, when she was talking about that story, you know, from the past, she kind of put this slide up with some of the streaming workflows collator code in there. And uh, it's one of the several other collators that exist today in our internal search backend that we want to kind of, you know, migrate. Uh, so to achieve this, we will start by creating a search backend module that's dedicated to streaming workflows and adding the search index registry extension point as a dependency. So right in that purple box. Okay, so recall that the extension point provides you the add collator method. Now in the module, we'll call the add collator with an instance of the streaming workflows collator and a schedule for rebuilding the index for streaming workflows. Okay, and guess what? Just like for plugins, you can provide configuration properties for your module that can be customized. So here we're actually gonna be uh, customizing that schedule um, that will be used for building the index. And uh, so we just read that schedule instead of like hard coding it, we're gonna be reading it from the app config and, setting, and using it when we are setting the collator up in the module. Uh, so that kind of wraps up our streaming workflows collator module example. And you know, when I was talking about all these different collators that we want to make available in the plugin, you would kind of essentially be doing the exact same thing, building out modules for each of them, uh, and then tacking them onto the backend plugin. We'll come to that next. So bam, all of the sweet streaming workflows collator code, you know, that we saw in that old ancient, you know, this you know, just crazy looking code that was in the internal search backend can now be encapsulated within its own module, right? And we can delete that collator file, obviously, that existed there before, uh, that multiple uh, teams were contributing to. Sorry, that's the, this one. So th that's this piece of code where a lot of different teams were going and editing this, this file and essentially creating a pull request to uh, get their collator added on uh, to the search backend, and we don't need to do that anymore, so that can go away. And uh, finally, the code owner's file can take a hike. No more code owners, uh, no more us being harassed by people to get you know, uh, PR reviews, uh, you know, PRs reviewed. Sorry, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, every team can build their collator within a module and own it independently. 
Nearly there. Sorry, that's a lot, but are you still with me? Yes. Yes, OK. <laughs> so as some final steps, we'll need to migrate the internal search backend to the new system. So here's some of that old backend code that we saw uh, that maybe we did maybe we saw before I'm not sure where we created the search environment registered the API routes and started the service uh, this is this was a lot of boilerplate code right that you needed to write every time you wanted to create a backend plugin so we'll start our migration by adding the main dependency to our backend here so this is just a yarn add command it's going to add the search backend plugin from the open source and then uh, we will rewrite the backend using the new systems, create backend API, and then add the search backend plugin to it. Easy. This looks like way cleaner, to be honest. OK. OK, but we still got to add our module. So that's what we'll be doing next. Uh, so we're going to add our streaming workflows collator module to it. And this looks very similar to the previous two steps, like how we added the search backend plugin and essentially start the backend. Oh yeah, we cooked good. So let's round that up. We've managed to rewrite our code using the building blocks of the new backend system. Obviously, we caught a big break here because there were so many packages, you know, the search backend, uh, the extension point, they were already created and available in, in uh, Backstage open source for us. Um, but we've also managed to encapsulate all of that streaming workflows collator logic into the backend module clean, intuitive, and succinct. And that is what I call a two-star Michelin experience. But I'm wondering, Emma, is there a way you can take us to three? Let me try. Okay. <laughs> How can we simplify this even further? What if I told you that this is possible, Tika? OK. So that we can simplify the setup uh, for our external search teams even further. Uh, we can set the search backend up using the discovery feature loader. And the discovery feature loader detects plugins installed in the package.json file without you having to add them to the backend setup itself, which could simplify it even further for our domain experts that would like to extend the search platform. So let's take a quick look at what that looked like for the module that Tika just created. So the first thing that we can do is to remove the search module from the backend setup. And then the next thing that we have to do is to add the discovery feature loader to the backend. And last but not least, every time a new team would like to extend the search backend with a new collator that they've created, the only thing that they really need to do is to add a P open a PR and add a new package to the pa package JSON file, which really simplifies the setup um, for our external search teams. Um, because the code review for this is really just reviewing the package JSON change. And so this really increases the autonomy of these domain experts across the company. I think that checked off the third star. Yeah, I think so. Okay, awesome. Okay, we have now touched on some of the building blocks of the new backend system. But let's continue to look into how we can connect these pieces to, back together in, into a fully functional plugin without, with uh, plugin metadata. And since I continue to always talk about plugin metadata and package metadata as the same thing, let's start by looking into the differences and how they relate to each other. We will then look into the future a little bit, um, because who doesn't love look into the future and how we can improve even further. So we will look into how package metadata can help us improve discoverability of the new, um, of the entire backstage ecosystem, actually. But first up, plugin metadata. Um, so plugin metadata is really what you add when you're creating a new backstage feature. This can be both a plugin or a module. In this example, you can see how we continue to build up the streaming workflows collator module uh, with plugin metadata. So we say which plugin it belongs to, which is search in this case, as well as the name of the module. And this plugin metadata can be used by other services. For example, the logger service uses it to attach the plugin, plugin ID as a field to all the mes messages so that we know which logs are coming from which plugin, for example. And now looking into package metadata, maybe the more exciting part, if you ask me at least. Uh, so in your package JSON file that you have for each of your backstage package, you define dependencies, the name, the version, but now you can also add backstage specific metadata to it. And this is required for all the backstage packages. And if you have it, it means that your package is part of the backstage plugin ecosystem. 
An example of uh, backstage specific metadata of our stream streaming workflows collator module is the role, for example. You can see here that it's the backend plugin module role. Um, the plugin ID again, which you did see in the plugin metadata before as well. So this is search, it should be the same. And here you can also see the plugin package, which basically should be the plugin uh, package that this module is for. So here we're extending the search backend. And maybe now you're thinking, may, how will I manage to keep all of this up to date? Well, I guess the Backstage open source project always got you covered with tooling. Um, so what you can see on the screen here is what I've added is a um, script to the package JSON file of the module that we uh, just created. And this script uses the Backstage CLI and specifically the repo fix command to generate the package metadata for you. Um, you can then, of course, add this to your CI pipeline so that you make sure the package metadata is updated um, and always stays up to date. And since, the, as I said, backstage, the backstage metadata field um, is required for all of the backstage packages. And it means that any package that defines this field uh, is considered to be part of the backstage ecosystem. Uh, all the open source pack um, packages that gets published gets published to the NPM registry where you can search for all the packages and find uh, packages that you would like to extend your backstage instance with. But sometimes that can be pretty difficult to find these modules uh, and the packages that you would like to use. And at Spotify, don't we love hacking? We love we hacking. We really we do. Hacking. So a group of engineers at Spotify um, got together and we're thinking like, how can we use package metadata to make the discoverability of modules a little bit easier? And just a side note here, but huge shout out to Harry, one of the engineers on our teams, who did a lot of pre-work here to make this possible. But let's take a quick look at what that hack resulted in. So what you can see on the screen here is basically two screenshots of the same page on one of the products that we are working on that's built on top of Backstage. So this is a Backstage plugin, and the idea that we had in mind was that you should be able to navigate to into a certain plugin and find both the core plugins, which usually like is a front-end plugin and a back-end plugin, but also any modules that has been contributed under the different scopes. So in this particular example, we look at search, and you can find modules contributed both to the core project, but also the, by the rest of the community. And this is all in one place, and all thanks to package metadata. And now I can't count how many times I've said metadata true. <laughs> throughout this last couple of slides. So before we summarize this a little bit, Tika, can you quickly say metadata five times? Oh, shit. Metadata, 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 metadata. Okay, you okay. got it. Okay, right, guys. So migrating to the new backend system obviously takes a lot of time and effort. So is it really worth the cost? Like, that's probably the question you're asking. And we think the answer is yes. Uh, we absolutely think so. Uh, we believe you can deliver your backend plugin significantly faster with this new system because it enables distributed ownership with a separation of concerns using modules. Customization can be contained within module configuration, and as you witness, it requires way fewer lines of code and ships with automation and tooling that makes it easier to maintain, right? Uh, and if you're a plugin author, you're obviously like, your main purpose is essentially building out a plugin that can be used by the community, that, you know, and, and it can reach, expand its reach through the new backend system. So your plugins will be faster to set up, easy to customize based on the end user needs, uh, giving them more control and, and enable them to get value out of it really quickly. So those are just a handful of reasons that we've illustrated like here. Um, and we're hoping that you're sold and wondering where you can begin your adoption of the new backend system. So our maintainers have written up some really slick documentation on migrating your backend, your plugins, and writing modules. So go check them out. Um, in this talk today, uh, we kind of covered only the backend uh, back system, but there's actually a new front-end system as well, which you can go and discover if you follow the documentation as well. And additionally, add that package metadata to your backstage packages so that we can make all of this fantastic community's work uh, more discoverable. 
Uh, so yeah, thanks for being here, giving us your time, and staying awake, because it's hard to do. There's a lot of <laughs> knowledge dump, but we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you have any feedback, please use the QR code. It's there. Any questions? So does this new uh, backend system mean that in the future you can install plugins without doing any code changes, also on the open source repository? So you just go into the UI as an admin and you click install a plugin and then you get it? Uh, no, so, oh, go on. No, no, no carry on. You, yeah. you already had a <laughs> Okay. Uh, so if, if I understand you correctly, you're wondering if it's possible with the new backend system to just like, you know, install a yeah, like like WordPress in the past. Oh, oh okay. That, like, okay. Yeah. Cool. So n I guess not really. So I mean, you have to like go and install the actual package to your uh, backstage app itself. Um, so that's that's something you have to do. Um, and of course, you know, you need to write the actual code uh, for that module if you're creating a new module that extends a certain plugin, for example. But if you just want to adopt a module that already exists in the community, uh, you can do that by adding that module to your backstage instance in like one line code. Yeah, yeah. and can I add something to that? Yeah, so essentially with the new backend system, it's more about, you know, especially if you're creating plugins and stuff, you cannot think about everybody's needs, right? You're building something that's kind of to your needs or like someone else has built it. But essentially what this enables is you can kind of put a plugin out there which can and then provide these different extension points that other people can build on so that the functionality can be expanded, right? And so as the community kind of adopts this, you know, and, and more people are kind of building, uh, using the new backend system, it essentially you will be able to find more features out there uh, to bring into your backstage and contribute to it faster as well. So that's kind of where we're trying to head. Yeah, so we're working on an uh, open source pr plugin for plugin marketplace, which is what you're talking about, where you can have that WordPress-like clickable thing. Yeah, so it should be there early part of next year. Oh, super. <laughs> awesome. Oh, more questions? Okay. Yeah, Hi. Uh, real quick. Oh, I, I guess I can stand oh. real quick. Okay, sorry. Next one. Um, so two quick questions. Um, so currently, extension points, to my knowledge, only are applicable to uh, plugins. But I was curious, is there any sort of um, objective of potentially adding this to the core services as well? To the core services. I don't know. I think that would be a question for the maintainers, actually, if they have found some. Yeah, we do have a maintainer in the room. And ben! I mean, I'm, I'm wondering with the Come core. up on stage. Yeah, so Ben's here. I'll let him answer. Yeah, because I think the, I guess from my perspective, the the most beneficial spot to add an extension point would be logging, right? Because you would potentially want to add a transport and want to, you, currently if you were to do that, you would have to completely override the core service and then install it. Whereas the extension point, you could just say, hey, you know, this is my fancy custom transport layer and then go from there. And I guess my other question is, with the uh, plugin metadata, do you have any plans on adding supported versions? Because currently, when dealing with plugins from multiple places, it can be a huge pain to try to figure out which version it was built for. And if it's too new, you could potentially run into problems where you might not be able to install it. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to solve it with the, the Yarn plugin package that they were demoing earlier. Yeah, maybe. Where you're kind of pulling in, essentially, if you're trying to, let me un uh, understand this correctly, but essentially when we're building towards the system, you've got so many different modules out there and there's going to be so many different versions out there and your backstage instances are in different ver versions. But I would imagine with, I'm, I'm just thinking about plugin metadata. Do we, we do not put versioning information in there, do we? No. We don't. So it's just a matter of like which packages, right? 
uh, but then I would imagine that Yarn plugin is something that can solve the versioning thing for you, even if you did add them as dependencies. Plugin metadata or package metadata is more about understanding every, like all the different packages that comprise a specific plugin, right? That's, that's all it is for. I don't think it cares too much about the versions here. The version itself, I guess, will be handled, um, yeah, w would be By like a separate, stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think they're exclusive. Yeah, right now, uh, I was just have seen personally firsthand how you can install a plugin, and uh, sadly, currently we can't use the Yarn plugin because we're stuck on Yarn version three. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But um, there's situations where the the plugin is not version agnostic, and you plugin authors don't always release a plugin version for that specific backstage release, right? So I guess my question is like, are there any plans to help? Um, make it easier for platform engineers to adopt plugins without being required to be on the a latest specific version. version. Yeah, yeah. Mm. not I'm, not that I'm aware of. No, we plans. are not aware of it. Okay, right. well, thank you for answering. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, just a quick question: um, What are Spotify's plans for the uh, backstage in terms of? future updates and integrations for the next year? What do we have, you know, in terms of looking forward to? For uh, what we can look forward to? You can, I think, find out in a talk the maintainers are giving tomorrow. <laughs> That's Ben and Patrick. Oh, nice. Ben, Ben's in the back there. But they're doing this great talk on essentially everything, like that they're gonna talk about the important key updates of Backstage and what's coming down the road. So if you're curious about that, there's a whole talk about it. And they're way more, I guess, like experienced than us because they're, you know. Yeah, I'm sure they will talk a little bit about the future roadmap as well. Maybe. Yeah. Perfect. Is it four four thirty tomorrow? Uh, yeah, four thirty. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the uh, question, yeah. though. It helps us publicize that talk a bit more. Go attend the talk tomorrow, guys. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thank you.